Thanks, guys. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn with me to John chapter 2 as we're going to continue in our study in John's Gospel. It's an interesting aspect of the nature of humanity. With the best of intentions, with the greatest of purposes, we can start very good things. Ideas, companies, organizations, churches, teams. We can establish very good things. And yet if we aren't diligent in making sure that, that, we, that we keep central the mission and the vision of why we started those things, over time, slowly, we can drift to where those things that we started with a very good purpose and good intention it can actually become very dangerous, very damaging. Uh, I've, I've done very few weddings in which the wedding pictures haven't been happy and joy-filled. And yet some of those joy-filled beginnings turn into very ugly endings. I don't, I don't know of, a, a, of many churches that started with, a, with an ill intent. Nearly every church starts with the, with the purpose, with the idea of we want to reach new people, we want to do new things, we want to spread and advance the gospel as best we possibly can. And as that happens, as churches like ours are planted and started and they grow and they do all these things, a very subtle switch happens if you're not very careful that the church that begins with this outward mindset of taking the gospel to other people, very slowly a drift occurs until the key principle is no longer reaching other people, but it's about keeping us happy. And it's not a very long trip that whenever your mindset becomes about keeping us happy, that before long a church that started with a missionary zeal ends up in nothing more than infighting and jealousy. Whenever you don't keep the mission and the vision central as a husband and wife, as a family, as a church, as an organization, as a business, as a team, you will drift and the drift is never good. That's what happened to the temple. That's what happened in the nation of Israel, and that's what we're going to look at today in John chapter 2. We're going to start reading in verse number 13. It's there that the text says, The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Uh, Last week, as we're in John's gospel, we saw how he launched his public ministry. So Jesus had lived kind of incognito uh, for 30-something years, uh, except for uh, the the miracles surrounding his birth, and uh, except for one little scene at the temple. Jesus was existing, this God-man was existing without anybody really knowing what he was all about. And last week, he finally made his public appearance. He made himself known. But he did it in a way that you and I didn't expect. You and I wouldn't have chosen. We would have gone into the heart of New York City or over into London or Paris or into Dubai. We would have gone to a place that there would have been a lot of cameras, a lot of people watching, and and done a a miraculous event right in the middle of all the chaos of, of commerce. But instead, what Jesus did is he went to this insignificant town, to this insignificant wedding where very few people around. And right when the couple was about to be shamed, he stepped in with without anybody really knowing about it, except for the disciples and a couple of the servants and his mother, he stepped in and did this miracle, and, and almost as though he gave a holy wink to his followers and said, here we go, we're about to get started. And, and while nobody would have ever chosen in that way, the Gospel of John says that that action caused some of his disciples to believe. And, and the whole book of John, remember we studied in, in, in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, that the whole book of John is purposed around this concept that John is trying to convince that pe- that people that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and, and that we might believe in him and in believing that we might find life. The whole purpose of John's gospel is that other people might believe in Jesus. And so it doesn't shock us that whenever he tells us the story of the wedding at Cana, that miracle, that first sign of the seven that's going to take place in these first 12 chapters, that the response of that was that people believed. Well, why he might have launched his ministry in a way that I wouldn't have expected and in a way that almost seems like plan B because of Mary. Well, once you launch it, the concept now is you want to stay on message. 
And so we would expect at the end of chapter 2, now that Jesus has done this tiny miracle in this insignificant place, we would expect him to do something a little bit more dramatic. Now that we've launched, now that we're going, let's do something amazing. Let's go up on a hillside and feed 5,000. Let's walk on water. Let's heal the blind man, give him sight. Maybe, maybe heal a child from a distance. Let's do something dramatic, Jesus. But instead, he doesn't. Instead, the text says in verse 13 that it was Passover time. And as a good Jew would do at Passover, you would, you would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And while you were there, you would give a sacrifice on behalf of your family, and, and you would pay a temple tax. When John's gospel, there, there, there are three different Passovers that are mentioned. It gives us a, a time frame for his gospel that, that we understand that the ministry of Jesus lasted at least two years, but it probably spilled over into a third year. And this is the first Passover that's mentioned. Now, some of you may remember, some of you may not, what the Passover holiday is all about. In the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was enslaved in, in, in Egypt, and they wanted freedom. They were living in that bondage and, of enslavement. And so God had compassion on his people, and he raised up Moses to be a leader for his people. And he sent Moses to Pharaoh to, to say, let my people go. And, and the Pharaoh refused. But over time, the Pharaoh's heart was softened because of plagues. His heart was softened to the concept of maybe it's not such a good idea for me to enslave God's people. And, and the last plague, if you remember, was the plague of death. And it was the tragic consequence that if, if the Pharaoh was going to live in disobedience to God, then what was going to ultimately happen uh, was that the angel of death was going to come over the camp and, and, and everywhere there was a, a small child, that, that child in that family, that boy was going to die. But God protected the nation of Israel, and he told the nation of Israel to go out and make a sacrifice. And once you sacrifice that animal, take the blood and paint it on the outskirts of your doorpost. So when the angel of death comes and sees the blood on your doorpost, he will pass over you. It was a foreshadowing of what was going to happen with Jesus. Uh, that even today, if the angel of death it comes into us, if, if he looks down on a believer in Jesus Christ, that angel of death looks upon us and sees the blood of Jesus, and the judgment will pass over us. And yet, if you're living here without the covering of the blood of Jesus, then it's just you all by yourself in comparison to a holy and just God, not a picture that you want. And so the Passover, uh, it occurred. The Jewish people were saved. The Egyptians were not. Chaos began to reign within the communities as the death and the, the suffering began to be experienced. And so Pharaoh decided to let uh, the Israelites go. He kind of changed his mind later and chased them, but that, and that, you know, that, that's a whole different wet story. And so, uh, but it turned out that the nation of Israel was freed. And every year from that, they began to celebrate Passover. And what would be required of them is that they would, if you were a good Jewish boy, specifically a man, you would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And whenever you got to Jerusalem, you would make a sacrifice, again, symbolizing, right, that, that, that you can't take care of your sin on your own, symbolizing that God was going to have to do something to take, take care of it. That was the whole sacrificial system in the Old Testament. It was a reminder to the people that their sin had a consequence, that it had a price, and this was a tangible price that had to be paid. And yet they, they even knew, or they should have known, uh, that the sacrifice of a sheep or a lamb wasn't going to be enough, that eventually God would have to do something. And so it's no accident in, in, in chapter 1 of John's Gospel that that John the Baptist points to Jesus and says, behold the Lamb of the Lord that takes away the sin of the world, right? He was pointing out, here's the fulfillment of the sacrificial system. And yet, as people would pilgrimage into Jerusalem, you know, it was kind of tedious to bring your sacrifice all the way from this far and foreign land. And besides that, whenever you don't really want to spend that much time with your sacrifice over time because then it becomes harder to sacrifice, Right? Like, you know, anybody that, that, that kills their own cattle for, for beef, they don't name their cattle, right? Because it's just, it's, it's easier to eat cow 47 than it is to eat Joey, right? Well, I guess that would be a kangaroo. But I don't know anybody raising kangaroo either. And so, uh, and, and so you know, it would make it difficult. And so some, some entrepreneurial minds decided, you know what we can do? There's, an, there's a business opportunity that's here. All these pilgrims are coming in from out of town, and, and they don't want to carry their own sacrifices. We'll raise some animals and sell these uh, to these pilgrims as sacrifices. And, and there, there was these other money men who, who, who knew that these people were coming from these foreign lands, and they would see them struggle to exchange the currency of their hometown into the currency where you could actually pay your temple tax. Because the temple wouldn't just accept any money. You know, if, if you were living in some far off place and, and, and there was idol worship going on by your leaders that were there and they had these, these graven images now on these coins, they wouldn't accept them in the temple. And so uh, they, you'd have to change that currency. Well, with all this exchange going on, all these great crowds that are happening, the money changers decided we'll make it easy. You just come to us and they begin to have a monopoly on this exchange system. 
And, and, and so Jesus is coming in to Passover, and as he's coming into Passover, he comes into the temple, and as he's at the temple, he sees these, these sacrifice sellers kind of bargaining and negotiating what's going on, and he sees these money changers that are taking place. And then verse, verse 15 to me is one of the most shocking verses in all the Bible. One that, that if you had never heard the story before, and I gave you 10 guesses of how Jesus responded to this scene, you would never guess this one, right? Jesus walks in, and he becomes so kind of enraged at what he sees uh, that, that he puts on his greatest Martha Stewart, and he, he takes just some, like, three things that are out there, and he makes a whip of cords. He, he makes a whip out of, out of these cords. And, and then, he, then he goes court and he love on the temple, Right? Ask, ask your kids what that means. And, and so he just, he, he just goes crazy. Like, like he just flips out. And, and he begins to take the whip and he's running the sheep out of the, out of the temple. It just, you know, kind of the yee-haw, get out of here. I, I guess you say yee I don't know. But I know that's shocking that, that I haven't, uh, you know. I, I, yeah, y'all know. Y'all, y'all get that. However he gets them out, he gets them out, Right? And then he goes over and there's these pigeons in these cages and he tells the people, take these pigeons out of here. And he says, do not make, make my, the father's house a, a house of trade. And he's going crazy. Now imagine being a disciple in that moment. You, you, you've decided to follow after Jesus and everything that he does. And you, you, you've seen the compassion in him. You, you've seen John the Baptist say, this is the one that we've been waiting for. He's going to take away the sin of the world. You see him at this wedding where, where, where he's obeying his mother even when he doesn't want to. And, and he's having this compassion on this couple who's never going to know about it, who's never going to understand it. But he protects them from their shame. That's the kind of God that Jesus is. That's the kind of man he is. This ca- compassion oozes and overflows. Maybe you even have heard and remembered that the prophet Zechariah said this was going to be a man full of mercy. In the chapters to come, you're going to watch little children run to him and the women who were pushed aside and beaten and abused be drawn to him because he would protect them. You're going to, you're going to see a mercy in Jesus that you've never seen before. And yet in this moment, he looks far more like Mel Gibson on a bad Friday night than he does like Billy Graham on a good Sunday morning. Who is this? And and what is all this about? Why did he do this? Now, I've had some people take this and and use this to then justify their angry response. Be careful. Be careful. There's a lot of stories in the New Testament that you and I need to emulate, that we need to look at, of letting the little children come, of, of forgiving, of, of keeping quiet when we want to fight back. There's, there's a lot of times that we need to wear a what would Jesus do bracelet, but John chapter 2 may not be one of them. You don't need to be changing water into wine, and you don't need to be flipping over tables at the temple. Some of you need to change wine into water, but that's a whole different story. This is not a time that you need to say, well, see, Jesus got angry, so did I. There, there, are, times, there are times in which I want to be just like Jesus. There are other times in which I, I'm scared to. This is one of them. What made him so angry here? And now let's frame it properly. I, I think it's fair to say that he was angry, probably. Uh, we know the Bible is going to say that, that do not, uh, uh, in, in your anger, do not allow that to cause you to sin. So anger itself isn't a sin. We can, we can clearly frame this as a righteous indignation, uh, not uh, that, 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 that he's feeling that, he's experiencing this in the moment. He, he's clearly passionate. He's not emotional. Now notice, there's a difference. There's a, a difference between emotional and passionate. You and I tend to get emotional. We tend to get in circumstances and are overwhelmed by the sensations and overwhelmed by what's going on. And in the midst of our finiteness, we allow our emotions to take off and overcome us and we act in ways that are inappropriate. This was not Jesus. Jesus in this moment was not taken captive by his emotions at the expense of his brain. That wasn't him. Jesus in this moment is passionate, standing up for justice, standing up for truth. And this is an action of love because that's who he was. We have to frame this in the context that this was an action of love. Well, how is this an action of love? Well, it could be that what's going on here, and maybe it can help us understand by, by where this took place. You, you see, some would look at this and, and say, well, you see, Jesus is anti-business. He's anti-capitalism. It, it might be the type of sermon that you might hear in a, in a non-Western place today as they look at this text, but, but I don't think he's anti-business. 
I, I don't think he's against the, these entrepreneurs figuring out a way to, to see a need and to meet that need and then to make a small profit off of that. I don't think that's what's going on here. I think he is anti-exploitation, though. And more than anything, I think he's anti-hypocrisy. And I think if you and I realize what's going on here, we'll see that. The, the, the temple the, the temple was God's design. It, it was a place in which people were supposed to gather to, to signify that they're separated from this world, to remind themselves of, of heavenly things. It was a place in which God was to be honored. His glory was to be made known. It was a holy place. It was a righteous place. It was a, a signifier in some part of what was going to come in heaven one day. And it began with this very good intention, this very good purpose. So you have to purify yourself before you went in there, uh, an outward act now showing the inward being of what had happened to your own soul. And and you had to make yourself right as you entered into the temple. And whenever you were in the temple, you'd be reminded of God's words, of who he was, of his love, of his encouragement. But over time, that that would start with a good purpose begin to drift. And before long, those who were in charge of the temple, the, the Sadducees, those who were in charge of the temple began to, began to say, well, as long as we do the outward signs, we can also do these other things. So they began to use religion as a way to knock people down, to use it as a way to justify that they're better than other people, to condemn others to make themselves feel better, to exploit the poor, to make a profit, they begin to live in that way. And, and so when Jesus walked in that day, he walked in the very outskirts of the temple, and he would have walked in. The first, the first place you went in the outskirts of the temple were, were where the Gentiles and the unpurified Jews could be. And, and so if you were a good Jewish man, purified and sanctified, you wouldn't, you wouldn't last there very long. You'd walk in, kind of do your business, and get on about your way. But, but if you were you and I, if you were a Gentile, that's as close as you could get. You couldn't go any further. You could worship from afar, you could worship from a distance, you could, you could try to get close to the action of what was taking place, but because you were a Gentile, because you didn't have the, the right last name, because you weren't born in the right place, because you hadn't done what you're supposed to do, you haven't gone through all these outward acts, you had to stay on the outsides looking in. Well, then a little bit further inside the temple, the, the good Jewish women could go, but then they had to stop. And then the, the good Jewish men, and let them be the ones to determine whether they're good or not, you, you have to keep your mouth shut, they would go then further in. And then even inside of, of that, if, if you were one of the great, the great high priests, then you could go even further in, sometimes with a rope tied around your leg in case you weren't as holy as you thought. They'd yank you out. And so there were these, these, almost these concentric circles that, that along the way, depending on who you were, you eventually got stopped, and, and hardly anybody was good enough to get all the way in. Well, where the money changers and the sacrifice sellers set up that day was not outside on the outskirts of Jerusalem. It, it wasn't even on the street leading to the temple. You know, if you, if you go to the lake, then, then chances are as you get on the outskirts of the lake, you're going to start seeing a lot of bait shops, right? Because they want to sell. They, they know there's a lot of people coming in from the outside, and, and, and they want to sell you stuff. So they'll set up on the outside so that whenever you're actually on the lake, you'll have everything you need. It, I think it probably would have been okay had these sacrifice sellers or these money changers set outside, up outside of town in some way. So when these pilgrims came in, they could provide this service and make a little profit. I think everything would have been okay. But instead of setting up on the outside, they set up where the Gentiles were worshiping. They set up where only the the dirty Jews could be. And and then they would sell their wares to the good Jews, to the holy people, to the people who were really headed in to do some real business with the Lord. And so if you were a Gentile that day, you would be on the outskirts. And not only now would you be on the outskirts trying to worship, but you'd have to be worshiping with all this chaos going on all around you. And, And Jesus steps into that. And the text says that his heart is filled with a zeal for his father's house. It's a quotation of Psalm 69, 9. 
where the psalmist is being overrun by enemies, having done what God had told him to do and obeying in every way. Now he's experiencing negative consequences. He's experiencing this persecution in spite of doing what is right. In the midst of that persecution, he's praying out to God, God, when are you going to make this right? When are you going to silence my foes? He's praying a prayer for other people. God, do not let them be distraught by what's going on to me. Do not let them be led astray because they see my suffering. And in the midst of that, he longs for the day. He longs for the day to go back when the temple was what the temple was supposed to be, when Jerusalem was what Jerusalem was supposed to be, where it was a symbol and a sign of God's love for all nations. Remember, God had chosen the nation of Israel. He was going to bless them so they could be a blessing to all nations. And when everything was going right, Israel was blessed. The temple was strong. They were celebrating and bringing glory and honor to God. And that was a ripple effect, a blessing to the nations. And now the psalmist in Psalm 69 is praying out, God, I long for that. I have a zeal for your house. And so when Jesus steps in and he sees what is supposed to be his father's house, the temple, not not this, not the church, the temple, he sees it's supposed to be one thing, but instead it's just become another place where you're doing trade. And, And chances are knowing these Jews, knowing these powerful men, these powerful leaders... What was going on here is it's not that they were just providing a service. They, they finally figured out we got a monopoly on this. And so maybe the first year that they set up their shops on the outskirts there where the Gentiles worship, maybe the first year they, they sold their animals at a very good price, very fair. Come buy your sacrifice here. It's just as cheap to buy it there as it is bring it all the way. But then the second year there was a little bit of a markup. And then the third year there was a bigger markup. And eventually, when when they had a monopoly on what was going on, they began to use it to actually exploit the poor. The money changers, they were the only game in town. Uh, They were the only people where you could exchange your currency and and pay your temple tax. We're not going to have a tax today, by the way. We'll have an offering later, but no tax. And, And so, since they had the only game in town, they would they would ex- exchange for an enormous rate, um, almost in, in ways that, that, would, that would make uh, loan centers blush in American society. They might charge you 100% or 200% or 300%. And they were exploiting these people who desired to worship. And I think what happened is Jesus walked in that temple that day, and what he saw in that moment was hypocrisy. He saw hypocrisy. People pretending to be at worship, but in reality, just there to do business. People pretending to go through these outward signs, to to appear close to God, but doing these outward signs, never having any desire for their inward hearts to change in any way. And then then he might have seen some of these Gentiles who, who long to be close to God, some of these women who long to be close to God, some of these unpurified Jews who, because of their own sin, their society had talked about how bad they were, how irredeemable they were, how they would never have a chance again, how they were now now, now stuck with these Gentiles. He might have seen the, the cry of the heart of these Jews wanting to get back to God, and he saw people desiring to worship who weren't able to, and he saw a group of other people who had every opportunity to worship who instead chose to do business, and it freaked Jesus out. I don't think that's the King James translation, but that's what it did. And this scares me. Because it makes me wonder if Jesus were to show up here today, would he lap in the worship of us? Or would he start flipping over tables? Because from an outward appearance, we all look the same. But what's going on inside your heart today? Are you truly here to find redemption? Or are you just here to do a little business? Are you, have you truly shown up in gratitude for what God has done for you? Or are you just trying to appease your grandma or your wife? This is scary to me. Because we're fools if we think that the sinfulness of the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and these religious Jews, we're we're foolish if we think that they were uniquely sinful. 
that we don't have that capability within our own heart, that, that we would never abuse other people, we would never look down on other people, we would never push them aside, we would never try to, try to push them down to make ourselves feel good, we would never take the gospel to abuse other people instead of reach out to other people. We're foolish if we think that we won't use religion for ourselves instead of God. We're foolish if we think that we're not tempted toward doing outward things to appear holy, never wanting to allow God to truly touch our hearts. This is scary for me as a pastor. It's Because I know, I know as a preacher how easy it is. Now, I know as a preacher how easy it is to take a text and just say, do better. You people need to do better. You're messing up and you need to do better. And it's a fun way to preach because I don't have to change. And, and it's a fun way to preach because it makes me feel better and, and you feel worse. And who doesn't like that? But it's not the gospel. Get this, dear friend, get this. I mean, I mean Jesus, here, Jesus here is taking a whip and whatever he does, he's saying, watch me. He's saying, watch me. Get this, what's going on here? He, he's saying, look out for your own hypocrisy. Because in the same way that he had a zeal for the house of the Lord, what he was having a zeal for was truth. And that house of the Lord, that temple was pointing ultimately toward him, toward the gospel of Jesus Christ that now says there is no way that you and I can be right with God apart from him. There is no way that we can earn it. There is no way we can, we can do everything to gain it, to grasp it. We can't be good enough. We can't do enough good works. We cannot be good enough to get it. And so God, out of his great love for us, has come down to this earth through his son, Jesus Christ, and paid a price for us that you and I could not pay. So that whoever believes now in Jesus has an eternal, eternal life, has a victory in Jesus, has a relationship with God because our sin is now wiped away. But the moment we begin to manipulate that, the moment we begin to change that, we are hypocrites. And so here's what this means. If you're in the middle of home group, and the message of home group is, you need to do better so God will love you. If Jesus were to walk in that home group, he'd flip your coffee table over. If you're teaching kids, and you're teaching kids, hey, we need to have character, and if we have character, God will love us. He's going to walk in there and set the building on fire. Get what the gospel is. The gospel is because God loves us, because he has chosen us, because he has sacrificed himself for us, because we are now believers in him, because of that we do good works. In response to what he has done, we do good works. It is not, it is never, it is in no way we do good things in hope that that will cause him to love us. And it's such a subtle switch. And it's, it's just as subtle as what was going on with the Pharisees and the Sadducees on this day. It is a subtle manipulation of the gospel. And the moment we make that change, God is no longer honored in this place or in our lives. That's the gospel. And the great danger for this place and this church is that we will miss the subtlety and we will confuse the idea and having heard that it's God loves us and because he loves us, we act. We will begin to teach others, you need to act so that God will love you. And it's anathema. And so Jesus walks in that day and here's why it's an act of love. They were lost in the system. These people were lost in it. The message that was being proclaimed is if you'll do all these outward signs, it doesn't matter what happens to your heart. If you'll do all these outward signs, then God will love you. So do these outward signs. And if they continued down that path, then thousands of people were going to follow down that path, believing that the way to God was to do these outward things. And God, out of his love, out of his compassion, showed up and caused a scene that day to say, hey, this ain't it. Here's the way to salvation. And the powerful Jews came over because now their power was being questioned. And they came over and said, they, they said, hey, hey, Jesus, what gives you the right to do this? You see, what had happened in that moment was that Jesus had just given a sign that he was the Messiah. That nobody just stepped into the temple and did what they wanted to. Nobody stepped into the temple and overlooked the, the power brokers and said, hey, I'm in charge now, except for the Messiah. So when Jesus showed up that day, and whenever he did the action that he did, what he was saying in that moment is, I am the one you've been waiting for. And the power brokers didn't like that, so they came to Jesus. And they said, hey, you're going to have to give us a sign to prove that you have a right to do this. Now, remember in the first sermon that we kicked off back in July on this series, we said, we said that Jesus was pretty quick to give signs to people who weren't asking, but very slow to give signs to people who were. Because so often the people who are asking for a sign, they're, they're trying to manipulate God. 
And, and we said in, the, in that, that Sunday that, that chances are the reason God isn't quick to give them signs is because it'll never be good enough. And so they'll ask for a sign, and they'll say, well, that was probably just coincidence. Give me another one, God. And, and chances are, if you're holding out for God to do something, you're lacking faith in that moment. And what God wants from you is faith. And so instead of giving you the sign that he wants, he's just going to keep on calling to you, believe me, trust me, follow me. And so the, Jew, the power broker Jews show up in the, on the scene that moment as I say, hey, give me a sign, Jesus, to prove that you can be doing this. Now, Jesus said, oh, you need a sign? Tear this temple down, and in three days I'll rebuild it. And as Jesus so often does when he's speaking to people who already don't believe, he speaks in a way that is even more confusing to them. And it's interesting to me here, notice what the text says. Clearly the, the power broker Jews of the day didn't get it, but, but notice what the text says. Verse 20, the Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? Verse 21, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. It means that Jesus spoke in that moment in such a confusing way that nobody knew what he was talking about. It makes me feel much better. So nobody understood what he was talking about. But just a few months later when Jesus died, as the disciples were looking back on this moment, they remembered. And after his resurrection, they remembered Hey, he said in three days. And, and now it's actually come true in three days. And yet those Jews just never believed. The power brokers were so concerned with their own control, so concerned with, with what they were in charge of, that they missed the good news of the gospel that Jesus came up and said, I can change your heart. I wonder today if you're waiting for a sign. Notice the irony of this. As the power broker Jews keep on saying, hey, Jesus, give us a sign, you know what he was doing? He was giving them a sign. At that very moment, he had just done it. You want to know who I am? I can step into the temple and do what I want. I am the Messiah. He had just given them a sign. I think it so often works this way. When you and I are holding out for a sign, we tend to be missing the sign that God has already given when we're trying to get God to act in, in a specific way, in a certain way, and until he does that, we're going to stand over to the side and fold our arms and, and, and pretend like God doesn't love us. In that very moment, we are missing the ways that God are mo is moving around us. What more do you need today? If you're holding out, what more do you need? What more do you want? Is it not enough that he has created the miracle of your own birth and the miracle of your own body in this moment? Is it not enough that, that your heart is beating at generally just the right uh, amount to make sure that it continues to live and yet gets your body full of oxygen, full of blood? Is that not enough? Is it not enough that the, he has sent the world into motion just slow enough to make sure that you stay on this earth, but just fast enough to create a gravitational pull so you don't fly off to Saturn? Is that not enough? Is it not enough that he has created a room for you and taken an introverted, shy guy and called him to shout at you every Sunday? Is that not enough? What more do you need? And if you need something more, I got something more for you. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for you. That's all you need. You don't need him to do this miracle. You don't need him to jump over this hoop. You don't need him to move in this way. You need to open your eyes in faith and say, God, wherever you go, I will follow you because I now trust you. If you're an unbeliever today looking for a sign, you've already got it. Stop looking for God to do exactly what you want and start looking at what God is already doing around you and for you and through you. But if you're a believer today, then at first you've got to hesitate at this passage and say, God, convict me in my life. What is it within my life where I'm getting the gospel wrong? Where I'm more concerned with outward appearance than I am inward transformation where I'm more concerned with some ritual, some, some, some outward sign than I, than I am what you're doing within my own heart. God, show me. And then within that, if God takes out the whip of correction, you can trust him so much that, that God is so loving and so kind that, that if he takes out the whip of correction, you can actually run to him. And because he only disciplines those that he loves here. And his discipline is always done out of love and out of hope. And whenever you run to him and your heart is changed into his likeness, you will look back on that discipline as a good thing. You can trust him and go to him. But make no mistake here. 
uh, make no mistake, we need to read this with application of conviction. That has to happen. We have to look at this as a church. But make no mistake where you are in this story, who you and I are. We are the Gentiles and the dirty Jews. We are the ones that the power brokers would look upon us and say, you have no right to God. We are the ones that they would want to push down and say, you're too bad and you need to get better. And whenever you get better, you come see us. You come talk to us knowing that we never had the power to get better. We're the ones that they kicked aside. We're the ones that they don't care about. We're the ones that they say our worship to God doesn't even matter so they can distract us with their business that's going on. And it is Jesus that has stepped into the temple and he has thrown over some tables and he has pulled out the whip for you. He's done it for you. And I, so that we might have access to God, so that we might have a way to God. And now we do have a way, no different than the holiest of the holiest among us. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done or what your experience is or how great your shame or how great your guilt. God has made a way for you to have full access to him. You don't have to earn God's favor to get it. Instead, it has been lavished upon you in every way possible. God fought for you. He fought for you when your husband wouldn't. He fought for you when your wife left. He fought for you when your parents didn't know how to show you love. He fought for you whenever all your friends turned their back on you. He fought for you when you were all alone. He fought for you when everybody else said you should be shame-filled and guilt-filled. He fought for you. He fought for you to give you this opportunity right now, to give you this chance to have a relationship with him. And anybody who believes in Jesus is now made clean and pure and holy and lovely and just. Oh, have you ever had somebody fight for you? Have you ever felt all alone and and abused and taken advantage of and somebody had the compassion to see you and to come alongside you and to love you and, and to say, in my eyes, you are worth my effort. That's what God has done for you. That's what he's done for us. We don't have to listen anymore to the negative voices trying to fill us with shame trying to beat us down with guilt. We don't have to listen to the internal voices within our own minds of trying to recall and recount the bad things that we have done and the failures that we have. Instead, we get to accept the love of Jesus for that is what defines us. For the one who brought a whip to fight for us later endured the whip of these very people, but he did so on our behalf taking away our sin and now making us clean. And he places his spirit at work within us. He begins to fill us with his love. And then from the inside, he slowly begins to transform us to where we begin to look like him. And they on the outside might have no clue because as far as they are concerned, as they look at us, we still look the same. But what they don't know is inside something has changed. And before long, it will define everything that we are. Jesus stepped in with a whip into this temple and confronted hypocrisy. He will do the same thing in our lives as well. But as soon as we let go of that hypocrisy and turn to him, we will experience his love. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me?